This is the first BAPA Accounting History Special Interest Group virtual workshop held on the 12th of January 2021. Thank you, co host. So I will let you carry on. Thanks, uh, thanks Matt. I'll just uh, share my screen. Um, thanks for giving us the opportunity to present our, our paper. And um, this one's by myself and my colleague Ken Weir, who's um, here somewhere. Yeah, so thanks for about so long. Yeah, I hope everybody had a, a good break over the, the Christmas period. Um, I've got a, a three and a half year old toddler, so I got about five minutes of time to sit and relax over that period. Um, <laughs> Today, along with my um, colleague Ken, we're going to talk about something that dominated my late teens and early 20s. Um, two things, really. Accounting, because I was studying for my undergraduate degree, uh, and then my professional exams in accountancy, and heavy metal, which was kind of the soundtrack to that um, time period. Um, so, basically, our title of our paper is um, Accounting Conflict Contestation, uh, the case of, case of neat records uh, and the new wave of British heavy metal. So a little bit of a, an unusual mixture, but um, the case of neat records in particular, we think is um, an interesting business case, and there's some interesting accounting points that we're, we're going to draw out as we go through it. Um, so the aim of the paper really is to, to add to previous understandings of the tensions and conflicts that can develop during production and distribution of popular culture. And the tensions that arise between um, commerce, between management, between accounting and uh, culture, which has been well documented um, across lots of different disciplines from management um, and even in accounting with papers on you know, fashion by Ingrid Jekyll and Chris Carter and the early sort of for reason to bring in uh, music into that. Um, with the work of Kenny Jacobs. Um, so there's been some attempts to, to explore this, you know, the debate between, in more general terms, accounting and creativity and creative behaviour has kind of gone in and out of management accounting and accounting literature. Um, we've gone from a position of saying that they were incompatible with one another to a position of saying there was some compatibility and it's kind of gone back and, back and forth. And we're trying to add... Um, additional evidence to that with a, a new scenario and we're going to achieve we, we think we achieve that by studying the role of accounting within an independent record company and that becomes quite important to the story and um, that was central to the new wave of British heavy metal movement that took place during the 1970s and, and 1980s and our study is based on a mixture of um, archival sources and um, from archive um, and down in Newcastle near where the uh, record label was based and also secondary sources. And as we go through, and um, obviously I don't want to take up too much time, so I haven't put up a lot of examples or any examples of the um, archival material, but it would be one of the areas we're looking for comments on is how to work in uh, that material into, into the paper. And um, I'll give some examples of, of the sort of stuff that we have access to uh, a bit later on uh, as we go through it. Um, Okay, next slide. Just as a bit of background, a bit of context then, um, in terms of accounting conflict, conflict in popular cultural production, as I sort of mentioned already, there's a, a relationship that's been examined between accounting control and cultural production across lots of different um, settings, whether it's um, uh, theatre production, um, musical production, fashion. You know, the relationship has kind of been proven over the years to say it's a bit more complex than I um, originally thought. You know, the original um, thinking along these lines was that, you know, there was a, a conflict there that artists um, sort of pushed back against cult, uh, commerce and they were, they were opposing forces. And um, there's been some nuance added to that argument. And that's kind of the position that we're adopting in the paper. We're coming to from the position of saying that there's a, a complex relationship. It's not binary, it's not um, a dichotomous, and we're trying to add some further nuance to that with our, our discussions. And in particular, the accounting studies in, in recent years have um, added, added value to, to this idea by saying that calculative practices in accounting have a significant influence over the production of culture. And that's been um, hypothesized in different ways. We've seen accounting put forward as this framing device which you know, sets an arena, like a, a budget, 
or an area within which these cultural practices can take place. We've seen accounting um, being depicted as something that mediates between the two apparently opposing forces of creativity and commerce. And then we've even seen uh, accounting being um, considered as an enhancing tool that is used to transform and, and improve um, cultural activity. And um, so a real range of um, different uh, depictions of accounting in, in this literature, and we're again trying to, to add, add something to that. And in particular, what we're what, what we're we sort of st we're starting from is the idea of um, accounting's non-being and accounting's absence is is something that has been uh, long discussed in accounting all the way back to to 1988 as it shows in slide. Um, and there's been some studies again throughout, and particularly in accounting history, of studying where accounting is not. Um, and obviously building on the, the famous um, Hotwood uh, quote there, and accounting becoming what it is not. And you know we're as you see as we go through this, we're we're really coming from a position where, um, as you might expect, accounting sometimes doesn't appear to be there, doesn't appear to be present, and um, doesn't appear to be a big part of what's happening. And um, but as we see as we progress, accounting does um, have a significant influence on um, on the business and particularly on the individuals who work their way through the record label, whose music gets produced, gets made, and those individuals in the end find themselves um, in a position where they've been let down by the lack of accounting. Um, and then we also see accounting making a bit of a, a reappearance as well, and we'll, we can talk about that um, a little bit as we go. We don't have a lot of time to, which some people might be thankful for, to go into the the history of the new wave of uh, heavy metal, but there's a couple of uh, points that I think are salient to, to the approach that was adopted in, in the records that we should cover. Um, the new wave of British heavy metal emerged at the end of the 1970s and 1980s, and um, in general, it fused the aesthetic of, of heavy metal, and um, it's probably too early in the morning to, to show you some of the pictures of the uh, the clothing that some of the the spandex clothing that some of the and the leather that were, were worn at, at during this period. So, the aesthetic of heavy metal and um, with the intensity of punk and quite similar to the punk movement, the new wave of British heavy metal music uh, movement was initially driven by um, independent record labels, particularly across England. Um, and in most cases, it was a go, go it alone businessman that had, you know, these businessmen had cultural values that were aligned um, to the musicians they worked with. So you know, they were interested in the music, they were interested in doing what's best for the artist as far as possible and you know giving giving those artists a, a platform to which from which to launch their music and um, but neat records was slightly different from this um, and most of the um material that we can find on on the record label suggests that the owner in particular was in it for reasons other than the music and the music wasn't really his cup of tea and in a moment we'll briefly outline the history of neat records and um, you'll find that the owner in particular was um, somewhat opportunist in his uh, as a approach to to the to the movement. So that's the history of heavy metal. The, the record label itself um, was one of many record labels owned by uh, David Wood, who had lots of different business ventures. Um, he started off in the 1960s. He had a discotheque. He had a recording studio. He had lots of stuff on the go. Um, nothing that was really extremely successful, um, although the report suggests that the, the studio was quite important in general to the local community. Lots of musicians and aspiring musicians recorded there, even if they didn't have commercial success on the back of that. Um, based in Walls End in, in Newcastle, Tiny Weir, um, and again, it was um, many different business ventures leading up to eventual success, and lots of different record labels. You, you know, we had um, different labels such as Wed Tink and, and others that had a few artists on them and, and David Wood explains this as being um, from his marketing background where the creation of more and more products is deemed to be um, sort of essential so he you know every time a, a potential new artist comes along he, he creates a new label. Um, mainly though the focus at that point was the impulse recording studios and every so often there would be a success story that comes out of there, a reasonable success in terms of some chart placings. They did get some some traction with some earlier music that wasn't heavy metal. That was, um, but again, it was sporadic and it 
it was ne- less to do with the label and more to do with a chance of the artist coming along to the studio and David would offer him the opportunity to, to release the music. But that began to change at the end of the 1970s when a band called the Tigers of Pang Tang um, came along and the studio then began to found, find some fame. Um, they had some reasonable chart success again. And then on the back of that, similar bands started using the studio and we sort of began to see at the same time across England, the, the movement, the wider movement uh, began. And um, that sort of sp- uh, sprung board the label. And this time they, Dave did stick with, with Neat Records that became the main heavy metal label for, for the studios and, and he ran with that. Um, in particular, it was two bands, um, bands called um, Venom and Raven, for anybody who's uh, interested in looking at some heavy metal after this. And um, they did generate some considerable success for the label and both bands went on later to sign for, for major labels, um, which again is a, a theme of the movement where um, the most famous bands might start off in an independent um, label, but then move, move forward um, to, to the majors. Um, building on this success, David Wood's plan, if there was one, was to sim- simply to encourage more bands within that genre to sign to the label. So he went searching for more of the same, which again is not uncommon uh, for this period, not uncommon for the music industry. Uh, in general, that's the strategy of the, the mainstream uh, major labels. You will put out more of the same and hope something becomes a success. So he wasn't doing anything unusual, um, but reports from both um, producers and artists suggest that um, you know, it wasn't really done with any sort of strategic planning. There was no consideration of even supporting those bands. It was just uh, motivated by getting more uh, bands for the chance to be more successful. So the, as the quote says there, um, signing ev- anything and everything, lost track of what was happening. There was no real plan. And that came from a producer who worked at the, the studios for, for a long time. That's kind of backed up by... Um, a quote from John Gallagher, who was a member of the band Raven, who said that um, it was just quite nice. David would start a snowball and ran out of snow. And we ran out of viable acts to keep it going. And one of the big problems was that he wasn't, he didn't appear keen to support the acts that they had signed to provide active, active support for those and to grow their careers. Rather, he was more focused on adding more and more and more. Um, so there was lack of development. And in the end, it was um, those sort of it was for those reasons that the bands ultimately moved on to um, bigger things or and bigger labels. And um, so, you know, that's a very brief overview, um, but it does give us some insights into the business practices and the business model that were adopted at, at the records. And um, this becomes important um, as we get into the idea of conflict and dispute because um, this sort of focus on um, not really being strategic having a plan of trying to maximise uh, revenues by adding more bands, et cetera, becomes quite important, um, certainly quite important for the artists and becomes one of their main um, reasons for, for disputing, um, in particular, royalties. Um, and you know, royalties are as commonly disputed across the music industries. It's not unusual for there to be. Um, again, even recently we've had lots of um, cases within um, pop music and most recently Taylor Swift and her uh, troubles with her her back catalogue and um, so it's not unusual and so that there's going to be disputes but what what's uh, interesting from the Neat Records case and what we find is that there is a lack of clarity around contracts around royalty payments around the flow of economic resources through the business there's a lack of uh, transparency and um, you know again reports, and it's, it is um, from artists who may be aggrieved, they're reporting that they never saw any money, they never saw any this all little advances, they never really signed any paperwork. Um, and certainly from the archival information, there doesn't appear to be a great amount of accounting to track those economic flows through the organisation. Um, there seems to be a lack of calculation and payment of royalties. And that's really borne out in some of the, the communication between David Wood, Neat Records, uh, and lawyers and solicitors and accountants who are acting on behalf of the artists um, as they um, as they try to figure out where the money has gone, how much they're due, 
Um, and David Wood often responds by saying, well, we don't really have that information to hand or I'm not sure. And just sort of scrambling around for that information. And, you know, this comes out, this comes out in the correspondence. Which is quite interesting that the absence of counting is um, either being um, deliberately used to, um, to, to avoid payment to artists or is perhaps being um, uh, is perhaps never been thought of by Dave as something that you would, you would actually have to do. Um, so on the back of that, um, there's a few disputes that, that started. Um, and in particular, what happened within the records is musicians would often pay the recording studio, so Impulse Recording Studio, the original studio, and they would then pay the label to pay uh, to press and distribute the, the records. Um, and they would receive a small payment in return for signing from the label. But after that, there's reports of never receiving any more money. Even the bands that went on to considerable chart success, they never um, got any money. And even that extends to the producers who, although they were salaried with the uh, studio, um, had signed production deals for some of the work and had never received any um, royalties from these. There was a couple of significant disputes that are worth mentioning and this is the main focus of, of what we're going to, um, to talk about today. Um, the main one was, uh, the first one, sorry, was Ian Jones. Um, so he was a member of a band called Blitzkrieg who had some, again, some minor success and their, one of their songs was covered by the metal band Metallica. So they did generate significant uh, income in the end. And we see lots of correspondence between David Wood and uh, the accountants acting on behalf of Ian Jones that highlights a, systematic, a lack of systematic and regular accounting. Um, again, this is where we see the John Seely and Cole asking for statements of royalties, asking for accounting information, uh, trying to agree a figure that is due to their client, and David Wood responding by saying, well, well we don't have the information for that, we don't have uh, access. It might take us some time to figure that out. Um, again, interesting to point to the lack of accounting here um, and delaying the payment of royalties um, to musicians. And we see another thing with the with another artist from the same band, Brian Ross, where we see uh, correspondence again, highlighting a lack of accounting records. Um, same excuses about not being able to access the information or not having the information to hand. Um, but then interestingly, we start to see both sides begin to use accounting, to use calculations, to recalculate and argue about the correct amount of royalties due. So there's a bit of back and forth between the two as they start to say, well, this is what we think the figure is, this is what we think the figure is. This is how we've calculated it. And all of a sudden, David Woods bringing the accounting back into it. Uh, and you know, when it's once he's accepted that the payment is due, um, he's providing his own calculations, which must be based on some form of accounting records, or we would presume so. Um, so accounting's gone from this uh, position of absence to a position of presence, but when it is present, um, it's contributing to the um, ambiguity of the situation, and it's not actually pre um, presenting any tools for resolving um, the dispute. Um, and I've talked about a lot there. I don't know if Ken has anything to, to add before we, we move on. Uh, yeah, thanks, Darren. Just a couple of points, I guess, for uh, clarification and example purposes. So um, when, when we are talking about the, the lack of accounting, we really do mean a complete and utter lack of accounting. Um, when when Darren went down to, to Newcastle to look at the archives, the, the accounting itself was often just one side of A4. And we only really know a bit more about the royalties through other sources. So um, Ravendale 1980, um, which is in the paper, but we haven't put up on the slides. That's not really that important. Um, it, it's an interview that was given in 1980 and that's when Dave Wood starts to talk about his business model. And um, we get from that the, the actual figures and some of the actual figures involved. So um, in that interview, and Dave Wood says, oh yeah, it's 12% royalties that go to the bands. But even then in 1980, the same interview says that only set, but the bands only ever received 7% of the royalties. So already right then and there at the, the kind of, at the heart of the, the new wave movement, we're already starting to see evidence that there is non-payment of royalties and constantly both sides are 
are battling after that fact about um about the amount of royalties due and we know from neat records side that it was supposed to be around 12 percent and subsequently in all the legal correspondence that we've gathered in the ian um in the brian ross and the ian jones cases that you know they're as as performance artists are hiring accountants to recalculate all of the royalties and Dave Wood's going back to his original calculations, which are very sparse. And then he's presenting a different figure. So we're getting accounting being used where there wasn't accounting before to really start to, to, to combat or, or be used in, in conflict to really, it's just really for, for conflict production in, in many senses, I think. Um, we're, we're getting Dave Wood trying to reassert control over the situation and then we're getting the, the, the two uh, claimants coming back saying, no, we're getting proper accountants to do all of this. So it's a really interesting set of conflict that arises from this initial um, non-accounting. There's a couple of questions in chat that we'll probably come back to on that point, but I'll just mute for now and then we'll go to the, the discussion. Yeah, can I just wrap up since we're... We're a bit of an over. Um, so yeah, basically we're seeing an informal, like, like we see an informal accounting system and kind of system of control, um, and that actually allowed the uh, conditions for the conflicts to emerge. So the conflicts surrounding the royal payments uh, emerge from the absence of accounting, and even when accounting becomes present, um, we see it sort of adding to the ambiguity, adding to the the conflicts in both sides trying to use different accountings, as it were, to, to argue in their point. And then yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Darry. Um, so I will uh, uh, pass over to uh, Alan. Alan is the discussant for your paper, and, and and then we can take some few questions and answer from there. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Matt. Well, thank you, Darren. Um, I read this paper last night, um, very late last night, um, and I didn't fall asleep, which is very good. Um, <laughs> uh, in the chat, I tried to put my uh, bullet points, but I didn't quite manage. But if you look in the chat, you'll see some of them. Uh, okay. I found the, um, as I said, I quite enjoyed the read uh, because it kept me awake. But um, this paper's sort of at, the, at, a, at a crossroads, I think. Um, it's pursuing a, a theory, a, a thought, a hypothesis, of whatever you want to call it, that I don't think the data supports. And I'd encourage um, you to look at what you've actually got there and turn it on its head. Because uh, to me, the the issue is not that there was non-accounting in the business, it was non-accounting by the groups, the bands, um, the non-BA. Okay. And it's almost like you're trying to fit the data into a, into a theory and force it into it. And I think if you stood back and just had a second think about it, I mean, the business model of the record company seems to be like um, Ajax, the football team's business model. Get them in young and naive, you get them trained up and then you sell them on because uh, the, the good ones, the good groups went off to join other labels and presumably David Wood, the person in charge of Neat Records, uh, would have got something for that. Um, it would be very strange if he didn't. Um, so that to me is quite good business and, and it seemed to be a model that worked for him for several years. I know that the, in the paper you talk about a year where they made what in that time was a significant loss for a small business, but it does seem a viable business model and he does seem to know the accounting details because when, as you report in the paper, when he's asked for them, he, he can provide them, um, albeit with difficulty sometimes, but I think it's a bit of a stretch to assume that in 1988, businesses kept seven years of financial data for internal purposes. I think if you ask for in 1988 for what was the costing for that project in 1981, you'd probably get the same response that David Wood gave, which was that he didn't have it. Um, just other points, just minor points, I think. Um, 
I think there would be it would people would be helped with some more critical thinking in it. Um, things are just presented and walked away from. It would, if you stopped, paused, and reflected on them, it would strengthen it. There's no page numbers. That's a bit of a of a negative uh, for people that are reviewing and read your papers, um, and that's a common fault amongst people um, I'm finding as a journal editor. Uh, there was no abstract, but the first two paragraphs are effectively an abstract, although a long one. Um, the paper's a bit long, at nine and a half thousand words. Uh, it could probably be compressed to about six. Uh, proofreading's a bit off at times, but you expect that in working papers. Um, the figures would be much better in the text. And that on that point, sources are needed for the figures. You just present them. Uh, in fact, sources are needed whenever you talk about archival materials, because you talk about them a lot, but you never say where they come from. Um, so we don't know where your data is from. Uh, well, we do, I think, because it seems everything seems to be secondary sourced. And that's another reason why I think you should step back from what you've got and attack it slightly differently, because you seem to be just repeating what's already out there in a condensed form. So it'd be better if you had a, a critical slant on it that looked at what was actually taking place and tried to interpret it in the context of the business model that was in place. And I think if you do that, you've got a, the makings of a very good paper. Um, there is a bit too much reliance on Tucker for a paper that is purporting to present its own data. And you've got to work out a way around that. And I think what I've just said does that. Okay, that's that's it. I really liked the the, the content. Um, I found it, um, as I said, an easy read, and um, you have some really nice data to present if you rework it slightly. Over to you, Matt. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Alan. Thanks, John, for that. Um, so, do, do we have any questions? Uh, so, we have a Q and A session now. It's for five minutes. Any question for Darren? Or? Uh, there is a question chat. from uh, Gary in the chat. In the chat, okay. Um, uh, let me read that out. Find that. Is that the question from? Uh, there's a long one here. That's so. Um, sorry, Ali, can, can you? Uh, it that? is. Uh, is it a lack of accounting or a lack of integrity or a lack of organization? What came first? Yeah, it's an interesting right, question. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think the, the lack of the lack of organisation I think came came first. I think um, from Dave Wood's early, or well, from the sort of history of Dave Wood's early business enterprises, it it was a bit of a jump around from from project to project, and he had a few short lived um, attempts at, at doing other things as well, and. Uh, he said, definitely seemed to be very much, and he said himself that he, um, you know, he's working based based on his experience in the sort of marketing industry of um, focusing on products ahead of um, organization and, uh, and strategic thinking, etc. So I think the organization, lack of organization, perhaps came, came first. I don't know if Ken's got anything else to add to that. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. It seems uh... Uh, quite a lot of interest in your topic, Darren, uh, which which is very good. Yeah, do, do you have any, any any other comments or questions? We'll have some few minutes, two more minutes. Uh, yeah, I'll just kind of come back in on, on what uh, Darren was saying there. Um, yeah, it seems to kind of all coexist in many ways, and it's, it's difficult to kind of like find what the, the initial starting point was, certainly going through the archives. Um, there's there's an obvious lack of, of accounting there. Um, but then a lot of the, the secondary sources that we're looking at have suggested that's just how Dave would operate. That he, he was a bit of a chancer and he'd jump on anything if there was any kind of, you know, if, if there was a, a smell of success kicking around something, he'd jump on it because he was there like at the disco scene and then he jumped on to um, the comedy uh, record scene. There was a lot of... Um, kind of Northumbrian um, folk music being recorded as well. He was a key figure in in folk revival. And then that kind of came and went. And then 
he latched on to the new wave of British heavy metal and then that became the thing. That's where ultimately a lot of his success was coming from. So looking at the, the records in the studio, um, the, the same lack of accounting persisted from these earlier attempts to try and kind of cultivate a movement all the way through to what was going on with the new wave of, of British heavy metal as well. That, that same lack of accounting persists in each attempt that at success that he was kind of driving for, that he was kind of orchestrating for. So specific to this, it, it's maybe a continuity of that lack of accounting, but it's just difficult to say without that uh, eye on accounting at the moment, if that makes sense. All right, All right that's good. Thank you. And there's another question here for you, uh, Darren Kent. He said, was doing accounting not just seen as a rock and roll enough for the band? I think, I don't know, I think I, Alan hit on the point, to be honest, which was um, it was young, naive artists that they were signing. And, um, you know, there are you know, there are quotes from, from some of the bands at that period saying that um, the piece of paper was shoved in front of them when and they signed it. And then, um, you know, so, so a lot of this is somewhat retrospective in that eventually they, after they'd finished their, you know, their early career and their, their touring and enjoying it, they sort of stepped back and said, well, we're, Where's the money gone? Um, and then it was, you know, it was probably too late by that point. So I think they were relying more on. So yeah, there's a, there's a, to be honest, the, a lot of the um, the artists seemed quite um, humble in that regard, and uh, they were just sort of saying that they were they were just too young to to really know what was going on. All right, I, I think we have two more questions there, but perhaps we'll take them before we go on a short break. Uh, one is whether the, the the contribution of the paper to modern accounting. So you can think about that and the ambiguity as well, whether you existed in some sort of commercial relationship. Uh, perhaps you want to consider this uh, before we go on, on, on five minutes break, or perhaps we, we, we can talk through that why, why on break, right? So I, I will share the program now. And when we come back, uh, uh, we're going to uh, go to the plenary speaker, Adam, Adam Smith. So, uh, Carrie, could, could you share the, 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 do you have the program? Yes, yeah, that's good. All right, thanks. So, so we, we have five minutes break. Uh, when we come back, we, we have Adam who will be telling us, um, actually he's a plenary speaker, so he's, he's going to have, um, a session on Emron, which is a very interesting session. So in the meantime, uh, if, if uh, Darren and, and where we want to add, address the issue of the contribution of their paper, that that's that would be very good. Uh, and then we'll, we'll come back to uh, Adam in the next few minutes. Yeah, that's no problem. Um, yeah, I think we would, the, 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 well, the aim of the, the paper and Alfie Allen point that we don't quite, quite make it, but we were really trying to um, um, to add to the to the recent body of literature which has been um, in the last few years. We, 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 we're still on the break, so um, if you want to stretch your leg a bit before uh, before we start the, the other session, that's fine. Matt, can I just say something about the contribution in the paper? All right, please, go yeah. ahead. Because seeing as it's been raised up, it was something, Darren, that, that I think you need to be more specific about because you just say we make a contribution mm -hmm. and don't say what it is. And I think this is where you're going to struggle with the approach you're taking in terms of trying to, to um, classify or categorize the paper. I think if you change the focus of the paper, you'll find the contribution becomes much more apparent. Um, so that's how I would deal with it. Thank you. Okay. All right, thanks. thanks, Alan. All right. All right, so do, do we still have any, any, any other comments while we're still on break? Only for one minute. Only for one minute, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. But I suppose there's there's an interesting question in the, the chat. Um, did accounting contribute to the ambiguity or highlight the ambiguity that existed in the uh, commercial ratio? Uh, commercial relationship, which is a really interesting point, um, particularly um, 
at least as I see it with with contracting, because we know from like Keith Negus's work, for example, that contracts are regularly used for for exploiting typically young and naive artists. And um, you know, rereading Keith Negus's work for the paper, it was a bit depressing to to kind of see all this, all oh, these uh, to to read about all these cases of bright, fresh, young things uh, entering into these exploitative. Uh, relationships with labels but it, it is that kind of story I guess in many ways that that there's a deliberate ambiguity in that relationship and it is just um, accounting therefore being used to kind of to further help the, the exploitation or at least to further assist with the exploitation in some ways with the with the disputes over numbers and so on and so forth. So in some senses, then accounting contributes to the ambiguity that's already there. But that would, again, just kind of assume that Negus's um, portrayal of the commercial relationship is is true, that it is just deeply exploitative and there's nothing really of value there to, to the artists beyond getting a platform to perform. Uh, if, sorry, if but where, where are you able? Were you able to get hold of these uh, commercial contracts? Yeah, we, we got um, we got some contracts from the um, the archive down at Impulse Studios, um, so we've got some correspondence there, and we've got a copy of some of the uh, the contracts. Some of them, I think, right? Because when uh, when you are talking about exploitation of these uh, young inspirational musicians or uh, artists, I think that probably the clue uh, is really in the contract and in the rhetoric that is uh, transmitted through the contract and how the contract uh, identify an algorithm for the calculation of the uh, of these royalties and maybe the known being or being <laughs> is uh, can be connected to um, like a textual analysis of of those contracts or something something that can relate to and do a better use of these primary sources that you have got. Just just an idea. But... No, no, that's that's very helpful. Thanks. Yeah, I mean the the legal correspondence we have does have. Um, a couple of disputed royalty models used for calculations. So like the, it's all, it's, I think it's all in like the Brian Ross um, correspondence where um, obviously his, his accounting team, his legal team have come up with an alternative calculation, an alternative heuristic, which differs to um, the one that Dave Wood had in their contract. And that kind of gets dragged out for a few pages uh, where we're reading this um, and it, it's quite, hilarious just the, the 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 way that the royalties are calculated because there's 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 this rather long figure and I think it's up to it to, it's like six parts or something and there's at least two pages of legal correspondence disputing the existence of e in, in this royalties calculation that was because we kept reading it going what is e and we're going back through the material going where is e where's this coming from which was quite amusing um I think um Ken, we need to stop at that point. Uh, yeah, sure, no problem. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, back to you, Matt. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. So uh, we'll go to the uh, plenary now. Uh, so we are going to invite uh, Adam, Adam Nix, uh, uh, who has a very interesting paper on Aaron. It's, it's, it's never ending story. So uh, back to you, uh, Adam. Yeah, I'm muted, Adam. Okay, that's good. Yeah, thanks. I'll just uh, share my screen. Okay, is that all right? Can everyone see slides and nothing else? <laughs> good. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, super. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to talk to you today. Um, it's really nice to talk to um, a new community of researchers. I'm not uh, from an accounting department myself, um, though quite a lot of the stuff I've done in the research, um, I do have some quite close connections um, to, to the field. Uh, my area is primarily business history, 
um, and organization studies. So um, some of the conversation today will, will really relate to, to that, but have some implications to um, historical research within a, uh, an organization and a management context more generally and, and accounting as part of that. So um, really, I was asked to talk about my research on Enron, uh, not so much in relation to the research itself, but in relation to the underlying method and particularly the use of uh, digital evidence um, in terms of, of creating um, uh, historical knowledge. And so that's really going to be the focus of today's talk. And in terms of what I want to talk about over that period of time, um, three things really. The first is to provide a bit of um, a conceptual framework and a way of understanding uh, digital traces of the past, uh, the digital sources that we might go about writing um, histories with uh, when, we, when we make use of digital evidence. Then specifically how I use digital sources in relation to Enron and then finally some implications for research um, and that will take us through hopefully broadly on time to the end of the session. So uh, to start with then, digital traces of the past. Uh, we're familiar with uh, the work of historians being very much um, one that is separated ontologically from their actual context. Unlike social science more generally, um, we can't directly engage um, with the empirical context with which we seek to develop insights. Instead, we, we make use of those traces, those surviving traces of the past, and predominantly within, hist within the history field, those traces have been analog in nature at some fundamental level. Clearly, they can differ in, in, in what sort of material they are. They could be uh, visual, they could be written, um, or what have you, but ultimately, until relatively recently, they were analog in nature. However, we're now moving within, uh, within historical research to a period whereby um, future practice is very much going to involve digital forms of evidence and with that computer-based research tools. And that's for two reasons. The first is that uh, archives and other forms of heritage um, and library organizations are increasingly digitizing their analog materials which creates a digital repro reproduction of that, that material um, and therefore we have uh, pre-digital material becoming digital and that's also occurring in organizations as they digitize their pre-digital material as well. <clears throat> we also, as we look to more contemporary history, see that the late 20th century onwards is predominated by traces of the past that were created digitally. So they are, they are not reproductions in any form and rather the dominant form of correspondence and record keeping uh, and, and document production is a digital endeavor. So in that respect, we have a, in various forms, um, the occurrence and the, the prevalence increasingly of digital sources. In terms of how we might define digital sources, uh, we define it within, within our research and the researchers that I'm working with in terms of digital sources as historical material containing digital elements, whether that's a circumstance of their original creation or retrospective alteration. And in terms of when looking at these in aggregate, we can see um, digital sources a lot like any normal uh, analog source, any, any traditional source uh, varying in structure, but ultimately um, that has implications that are particular to uh, digital sources. So, of course, we can have uh, digital sources that are just formal extensions of normal archival process and part of archival collection. So these are materials that are formally archived, um, they have finding aids connected to them, uh, they are catalogued, and there is archival scrutiny that uh, underlies their existence. Um, and, and engaging with these sort of sources to a certain extent will be fairly familiar to anyone that is used to dealing with uh, an archival environment, albeit there may be some added features like the ability to search within the documents themselves rather than just at the level of metadata so those finding aids about the sources we can actually start searching within them. Equally we can look further afield away from archives and we can also start thinking about uh, the collections of uh, sources that are available 
in databases that are available publicly to look at but aren't treated um, as a preservation for um, historical or record keeping um, purposes per se. So for instance, um, a lot of um, uh, government and uh, non-governmental organizations document various parts of their organizational process and make these available for transparency and accountancy reasons to the public um, to search them. So for instance, my own research on Enron related to federal uh, e-library collections of material that was part of that federal agency's process in how they dealt with energy regulation. And so uh, the sources I, I made use of weren't there um, and weren't preserved uh, for um, uh, archiving <coughs> the past in, in that sense, rather they were there to provide an account of what that um, agency had been doing and the decisions that had been made. But nonetheless, these are available um, for historical research um, in various contexts. And they're, they're reasonably well organized, but ultimately they don't have that archival scrutiny. Um, rather, it's generally based on the criteria of just things going through the system, get put into the database and are available to search using standard um, search processes that you'll all be familiar with uh, from the uh, from the journal um, uh, and various other uh, search databases that you've used in your normal work. So that's another form of, of data, um, uh, another way of engaging with digital sources that's perhaps slightly different to more analog equivalents. And finally, we have <clears throat> Uh, large data dumps that occur periodically and often these occur as part of, of some form of, of political leak of information uh, and clearly there are um, ethical implications with using such data uh, but nonetheless such data exists and um, uh, based on, on this data and the availability of this data, where someone were to use that data, they would find very unprocessed digital information. It would generally just consist of a scrape or an entire hard drive, um, and it would be left to the researcher or the, uh, or, the, or the archival professional working with that information to preserve it in an organized format. Of course, it's worth mentioning that with with analog sources with traditional sources you have these this variety of ways in which um, uh, information can come to us and we can gain insights on the past it's just that the nature of digital sources means that that how this information comes to us um, and how we work with it is ultimately changed and particularly in relation to the quantity of information we get when we do get get access to these sources so in terms of understanding the different types of digital sources, something I've been working on with my, uh, my PhD supervisor, Stephanie Decker, is looking at how we can introduce some of the concepts um, from digital humanities into um, the uh, historical methods that underlie uh, business history research, particularly looking at source criticism and, and how we can think about the authenticity of a digital source in relation to its digital nature or the digital characteristics that underlie um, the affordances we have about that source. And so we can think about digital sources um, in a number of ways, but primarily we want to think about whether um, that digital nature is something that is optional, something that we have chosen to add to a source, or whether it's intrinsic to that source's character. And so, of course, if we have something where it is optional in nature and that source is in its purely authentic form, if it is the authentic original of a source, then it will be analog and non-digital in nature because clearly it can't be, uh, can't be optional and, and have um, uh, been in an unedited format. Of course, we can choose, as I've said, to make that source digital. We can digitize it and we accept that we take it away from its original authentic format as an analog source, but in return we get certain affordances from that digital digitization that allow us to work with that information in a different way. Contrast this, and this is particularly true of um, a more contemporary sources, born digital information has only ever existed digitally. It's the websites, it's the emails, it's the Word PowerPoint um, presentations and Word documents we create, um, and they are created digitally um, and ultimately uh, exist in their authentic form as digital files. Equally, we can edit these, we can choose to edit these. So if we look at how to archive web, or if we look at how we might want to archive e email, 
we may need to uh, conduct certain processes on that data to make it preservable or to work with it um, for our analytical purposes, for whatever research questions we seek to answer. And equally, we might need to work with it in order to uh, negate some form of format obsolescence that occurs as certain types of file or, or certain forms of storage become obsolete and the uh, either the software or hardware um, uh, codependencies that exist with that material uh, disappear and, and become unavailable. So that's just one way to think about these various digital sources that we're dealing with. And in my research, we primarily look on, at the intrinsic side. We primarily look at born digital material that is, is used in a re -digital, reborn digital form. To quickly cover off digitization before spending really the rest of this talk talking about born digital, um, it's worth pointing out that um, while digitization can be seen as quite a, uh, an uncomplicated, at least methodologically, process, it's worth considering that it does have some implications for, for researchers. So um, <clears throat> for those unfamiliar with the digitization process, here we have a, a tweet from the Bering Archive. Um, of some accounting information being digitized, and that essentially is uh, the process by which generally photographically analog information, in, in this case what appears to be a, uh, some form of ledger, is represented digitally uh, by, by, by um, high quality photographs being taken of that, of that source. This enhances preservation because, of course, you can preserve a copy of that information in case the physical is lost and it enhances accessibility. It can be um, made available online to multiple users simultaneously. Um, it also adds an, a layer of archival scrutiny. And this is where we have to start thinking a little about how digitization changes the way we actually create historical knowledge in terms of the research, uh, sources we engage with. Ultimately, uh, digitization is an expensive process. It tends to be done by very or the more well off uh, and wealthy um, institutions that have this technology available and can do it at scale. Um, and therefore, to a certain extent, the, um, the selection and scrutiny that goes with um, uh, that digitization process does have scope to uh, preference certain types of sources over others and sources from certain um, contexts over, over others. And of course, when making digital information uh, or analog information more accessible via digitization, that has some implications into the likelihood of it being used to inform some form of historical insight. Additionally, and as their hashtag in this tweet suggests uh, with historical big data, this process also opens this information up to new forms of analysis. So computer aided research uh, rather than uh, working through this information um, in, its, in its analog form. And of course, some people may choose to digitize manually, uh, historically, uh, and then work with it statistically. But nonetheless, this, this makes available that, that scaled option. That's not something I had to deal with, particularly in my research. Where my research dealt with digital sources is in what we call the post-analog past. So this is the point in about the mid-90s where um, digital document production, digital communication um, and digital records keeping become the predominant way um, of, it, of, of working within organisations particularly, but within um, uh, society more generally. And so what we have here is a movement um, from primarily analogue to primarily digital. And the question then arises, how do we actually research pasts in which the traces left behind were created digitally. Um, going to a traditional archive uh, doesn't allow that sort of uh, insight into the organization um, and the way in which that information is preserved is materially different. So it, it, it pre presents uh, a certain set of challenges that we need to then navigate. Uh, and these challenges are what I had to navigate in terms of my PhD research on Enron. Um, uh, and it's also some of the things that we've been thinking about um, after the PhD in terms of particularly email data. So digital sources and Enron. My thesis, um, uh, which was, I did my PhD at Aston Business School. 
and uh, Carolyn Kindly was the internal super, um, uh, examiner for that, uh, was on the social foundations of organisational corruption. So really what we were, I was looking at in this research was how organisational organizational corruption can be used as some form of strategic practice uh, and can be used to achieve organisational goals. And by looking at day-to-day um, -day correspondence within a corrupt organisation, um, I was able to look at the, some of the social aspects of this and how it was collectively actioned and how it occurred uh, and changed over time um, at, at very much the day-to-day the -day practice level. <clears throat> the empirical focus for this research was Enron, um, but uh, unlike, of course, I don't need to tell um, a, a Zoom call full of accountants that Enron's most well known for its accounting scandal, I look specifically at the California energy crisis, which is um, a aspect of the Enron story that relates to market manipulation of deregulated utilities markets. So what we have is the state of California deregulating its, um, its energy markets and then through various loopholes that were created in this, in this uh, deregulation um, and uh, strategies developed by Enron and other organizations, um, a level of, of, of market manipulation occurred, significantly increasing the wholesale price of energy and contributing to the crisis uh, that also created blackouts and economic damage for the state um, and, and the broader Western region. So that was the empirical focus. And I looked at this, um, this through three main forms of source. The first was the Enron email data set. So this is in its entirety a data set of some uh, near, nearly 6, 600,000 emails from 50 users. Uh, the attachments and some personal information have been removed, so it's just textual information, uh, but they are in their individual file structure and they're structured in relation to the individual user folders. So in terms of what I was talking about earlier, this is a reborn digital source in the sense that it has been altered before being made publicly available. Additionally, and this ended up becoming really the, the, the primary source that my research was based on, the Enron trader tapes. So um, because this related to trading activity that was uh, primarily happening on the phone, um, digital audio tape recordings were taken of any trading conversation uh, between Enron and various market participants, participants. And this was for oral offer and acceptance purposes. This, inf this data was then subpoenaed by um, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And uh, ultimately, uh, some 368 calls were transcribed and released publicly as part of the um, uh, investigation into Enron subsequent to their collapse. Um, and this, this information relates uh, directly to that trading activity in the deregulated energy markets. And additionally, I triangulated these quite um, uh, contextually sparse sources with um, uh, other judicial sources like witness testimony and expert, um, expert witness testimony, various legal arguments and reports, which added some context to what were otherwise fairly bare pieces of, of digital correspondence. So in terms of um, emails and today, emails are already used within within linguistics and, and computer science research they've been used for quite a long time and they're a particularly useful source of naturally occurring dialogue um, there's uh, 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 the linguistic data consortium has various data sets available but they're dealt with computationally they're dealt with statistically they're not dealt with as as uh, sources of historical information and therefore that it's not the uh, the insight we can gain about the content of the emails rather uh, these uh, data sets and the approaches used with them are about understanding the language of the email. There has, however, been some work done in history and management studies on things like the Enron corpus. But again, this is primarily been used uh, using um, that information in its aggregate form. So there wasn't really an approach for me to actually start using this this data historically and working through it. So. Essentially, we had a problem where we had an inbox that potentially had valuable uh, glimpses into that organization and how things were being uh, occurring and the decisions that were being made. 
but we also had um, a set a, a data set that was providing an excess of unrelated con content of course half a million emails is is far more than anyone can actually analyze qualitatively we also have a lack of that categorizing information we don't have those finding aids we just have its its raw data structure and we have uh, an abundance of emails unconnected to my research questions or indeed the organization itself what you find in this period is that um, uh, inboxes were were very busy affairs fairly unorganized um, and often had a lot of information that was about gym memberships and various things like that and really had very little uh, value to my specific research questions and, and more broadly is the sort of thing that wouldn't survive traditional archival scrutiny so what I needed to do was isolate a subset of emails that were going to be useful and make them manageable for qualitative coding. And I did this through this process. Um, and this is really just to sort of illustrate how we can start actually going about making some of these sources available for actually working with them um, and, and producing historical research. So uh, the first thing I chose to do was, uh, was isolate the, uh, the specific user accounts relevant to the division of Enron I was interested in. So this took my um, uh, 500 odd thousand uh, emails over 50 accounts down to 25,000 over 20 accounts. Um, that was easy enough for me to do because I was interested in the specific division of the organization and could make that, 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 um, that, that limitation. Additionally, I then decided to only use sent emails uh, to uh, better ensure active usage, but also to, to make another uh, reduction in the, in the total number of emails. My decision for using sent emails is that ultimately, unlike an inbox, which you can, you can maintain passively, there's nothing stopping you uh, ignoring an email, not seeing an email or what have you, um, a sent folder provides a slightly more active insight into um, a, a historical actor because they have had to consciously reply or initiate some form of correspondence. And so um, ultimately, given the limitations of the research, it was felt that that was the best way to get the most out of the data. And so this took the 25,000 emails down to uh, just over 4,000, which, which meant I could actually manually read through them and code them um, without having to do any statistical work on them. Um, and so this was ultimately what we did. So it clearly it abridges the collection significantly, but, um, but nonetheless, um, it's, it's very useful in terms of, um, of, of, of limiting the focus and being able to find something out. We then had to clean them and I did this via regular expressions um, and uh, using various command line programs, which I won't go to, into too much detail now. Um, nothing overly complicated and all available uh, if, you, if you search how to do that on Google. And then finally it was imported into Envivo for coding. So that was really the process of working with the emails. As you can see, another problem you have with emails is they don't survive well over time unless they are actively archived. So because this is just taken from a server um, within Enron, you can see that actually you have a significant tail off of emails as you move back from the point at which that data was, was, was taken. Um, and if you look at the red line, that's the actual uh, spike in the crisis. So actually you can see that I have relatively limited amounts of email for the period I'm actually interested in. So again, emails were somewhat limited. Um, trader tapes uh, were, were again, a difficult thing to deal with. You have that real quality of ephemeral daily life, but um, ultimately you do have to uh, generate some um, contextual information that's otherwise missing. Um, and also you have to work out how to best deal with that information in terms of how it's, how it's presented to you, how it's transcribed. So um, we needed to build this understanding of each call and also um, organize them in a structure that was readily analyzable. Just to give an insight, the sort of ephemeral um, uh, pieces of communication you might get from these calls. Um, we have here um, a call showing how traders moved on to a secret uh, form of uh, communication by moving between their recorded line to their cell phones. Um, so you want me to call you right now? Yeah, on a non-recorded line, your side too. I love those calls, all right. So you have these sort of little exchanges that you can pick up in the data. I'm just conscious of time, so I'm going to um, spin through. I'm not going to talk about this just now, but essentially 
Um, ultimately, we, I structured these in terms of their chronological order to better understand the tapes over, over time rather than in the order they would have been submitted to the FERC. They're also very much tightly um, framed in terms of particular periods. And this was quite useful for my research, unlike the email, because as you can see, you have a high frequency of calls at those points where it's spiked. And this is because ultimately the judicial inquiry was interested in those periods, as was I. So um, uh, by, by chance, you have a particularly rich source of, of information about the particular things I was interested in. Equally, there's nothing to say that would be the case in every occasion. So in terms of implications for research, um, relevance of new tools. So corpus linguistics is an area where historians might start to look at ways where in which they can use this sort of information. Um, so here we have um, a piece of software called Anconk, and this is the Harry Potter books for uh, want of a better example. And you can look at um, uh, text in lines of concordance and you can see how certain words connect with other words and you can start searching through large bodies of text um, in a way that's rather than reading through absolutely everything, you can get somewhat summarized snippets and you can use this process to actually work through large bodies of data. This is not something I did, but it, it provides scope for historians to find these, pieces, uh, these, these tools more useful. These are some tools that you might find useful for yourself, and I will link these slides after this presentation, so feel free to look at those, um, and there are some links there. Ultimately, Born Digital sources provide that fly on the wall um, nature um, and, and insight into organisations that you don't necessarily get with particularly formally archived sources that tend to look at the higher parts of the organisation. So marginalised actors can be better represented, and you can get a better feel for day-to-day -day organizational life. Um, and of course, once you start looking at these new forms of communication, you can also start looking at new forms of discourse. Um, and it allows for very specific understanding of particular events and periods. So for instance, telephone calls were measured by the center second. There's also implications for source criticism in relation to triangulation. Uh, you've got machine readable files. You can look at so how sources um, have been verified electronically. Um, uh, however, of course, you have the scope for um, fake, fake, uh, new, fake news. You have um, uh, potential duplication issues and you have various issues there that from a, a source criticism point could be quite problematic. Um, and then there are some other practical challenges to consider in terms of navigating between the macro and the micro because you have with the digital communication such an abundance of information and this information is generally connected via quite a observable and formalized network of correspondence because you have that digital network intact you need to have an interpretation of both the individual sources and their content and those sources place within a broader network of communication. And that's something that um, while as historians, we've had to do uh, to a certain extent, thinking about the correspondence that we find in things like letters um, or what have you, it's something that, that occurs in a very different way once that, that, that network of communication remains intact. We also, of course, have that overabundance and underabundance issue. So when we're qualitatively reading, we need to find a way to select. But of course, we also have information that's quite contextually sparse. In of itself, a phone call might have some potential for really rich insight, but without some context about who is talking, when they're talking and what they're talking about, that information can be very hard to, to use effectively. Um, and it was, it was only because I could triangulate my information on the Enron that I was able to go about doing that. Of course, you then also have added implications in terms of access and ethics. So balancing the historical use case um, with the fact that you have added issues of contingent liability and privacy and protecting those things are more difficult when you're dealing with large quantities of digital information. Uh, and digital pre pre um, presents ultimately new challenges to, to the historical and archival norms that we've come to um, expect. So for instance, it may be that the uh, need for anonymization 
of, at some level, particularly at an individual level, might become more important as we move forward in working with digital sources. This is just to say that there is a, a project ongoing where um, uh, I'm working with colleagues about contextualizing email archives. I won't go too much into that because I can see I'm out of time, um, but um, there's a link at the end if you'd like to know more about that project. Um, so yeah, just to summarize, digital sources uh, differ in terms of their digital format and their authenticity. A digital source isn't uh, the same necessarily as other forms of digital sources. They can give insight into both the pre and post digital past. They can offer significant opportunities, but ultimately need to be used critically and reflectively. Uh, and that's particularly in relation to their digital nature. Uh, and in addition to the normal criticism and reflectivity that we have in source in our use of sources more generally and born digital in particular will likely require the use of new tools and skills. So thank you very much. Sorry, I sped up a bit there at the end, but um, that's everything from me. Well, thank you very much, Adam. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I think that was a very nice one. Yeah, uh, so we, we have time for some few questions and discussion. Um, I think there's a question here coming up already. Uh, Adam, perhaps you can look at that. What, what, what do you define as history and archive? Do you have a link between those, these two concepts? Yeah, um, yeah, so I, sorry, I haven't seen the question in the ch chat, but just responding to your summary of it, um, that's, that's very true. I do take quite a traditional definition of an archive uh, in being an archive, ar an archive being something that has a level of um, archival scrutiny um, imposed uh, upon the collections within it um, and that they exist um, within the, those norms of archival practice. Um, I appreciate that you can have archives in the far more informal context in, in the sense that um, an archive, particularly within organizations before they have been um, perhaps accessioned to, um, uh, to, to larger archives, those, aren't, those do not have those sort of finding aids and that process undertaken upon it. And they may just be uh, the analog equivalent of the data dumps I was talking about. So, so yeah, I appreciate that um, history uh, historical insight comes from sources in, from various contexts, and um, I mer merely differentiate between um, formal archives that are likely to do digitization processes um, and, and those sort of contexts where you might get um, uh, digital sources that um, are, are more akin to the e-libraries that you get within some government organizations. Yeah, thanks. That's quite a lot of emails there. Did you say about 12,000 emails? Uh, so I, I analyzed uh, just over 4,000, but the entire corpus has uh, nearly 600,000. Oh. So, I mean, that's been worked with statistically, but. Mm. Wow, and uh, I guess in, in individuals have to go through these emails, right? And no, I mean, no one has ever been through the emails to my knowledge, individually, I don't. I, I'm not sure what would be gained from from manually going through all of those emails. In terms of removing privacy information, that was done by by programmatically. Hey, can I ask about the emails, um, Adam? Yeah. Over what period was were those emails? How many was it months or years or weeks? Yeah. So um, I, I I flashed through it in the end because I was running out of time. There was a, a slide in there that, that that has the emails over time, and it was about um, it's about a two two year period where you've got emails. And the problem is, of course, um, people tend to to delete emails um, mm -hmm. after a period of time, uh, and also the organisation uh, didn't have any um, uh, archive uh, proper retention policy for for emails. So it's just what happened to be on the server at that period of time. Okay. All right. Uh, I think there's another question here for you. Perhaps we'll take that before we, we have a short break. So how much do you think the access to archives of big data analysis, their data analysis will change the face of business and accounting history? Um, so in terms of access to undertake big data research, was that, sorry? Yeah, that's from Carl, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, ultimately, I, I, there will be more opportunities for for that sort of research within 
as part of historical practice in the future, uh, in the sense that a you have organizations digitizing their records, which makes that more available to be included within um, big data analytics, but also as we start dealing with um, organizational periods, uh, sorry, periods where um, digital records keeping is the norm, where organizations and organizations are accessioning digital material already, it's just still under the 30 year rule, um, that um, that information will will be will be there to be incorporated without digital digitization in the future. So um, in the years to come, that is likely to only increase. Uh, the question is how that that is done uh, within our 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 existing methodological frameworks and the way we go about our research. Hmm. Sorry, I have a question. Can I ask, please? Uh, yes, please. Uh, yes, uh, we have a few seconds left. Go on, please. Thank you. Uh, I just called a couple of questions. You said you have coded the emails using in vivo, but you didn't mention like the calls. Have you coded the calls as well? Or you yeah. just got the number, the number of calls and the number of emails? Because the results are just showing like the number of emails and the number of calls, I, as I believe. Also, what's the uh, theoretical background of the research? And uh, what's the, uh, uh, like, what you would like to answer in this research? Is it like the increase in emails and number, number of emails and calls during the crisis or after the crisis or before? Um, yeah, it's just not clear. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, so in terms of the, the, yes, I coded the, the telephone transcript too. Um, I initially tried to to create, yeah, um, I co coded them. I had to code them on the PDFs that, that they would they were uh, were provided on, rather than than as as dynamic text, which made it slightly more difficult. But nonetheless, that was how they were coded, and the emails were coded in the same manner. Um, in terms of of the theoretical framework, I was looking at it from a social capital perspective, but ultimately I was interested in understanding um, organizational corruption, which is in itself a distinct theory, um, in relation to the practice of corruption rather than what dominates within that research, which is the underlying ethical decision making that leads to it. So I was looking at the how rather than the why. Uh, and in terms of your, your final point, so I wasn't so much interested in what the uh, the nature of the communication um, said about that 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 empirical setting, um, in the sense that, for instance, looking at reciprocity norms or looking at at the nature of reply or frequencies, anything like that, which which exists, and there are papers on that in relation to the Enron paper. I was more focused on the content from a historical perspective, and therefore, um, while I, while I had to take into account. The aboutness of the of the source I was looking at when it when it occurred by whom was it was it created, it was it was ultimately what was within that source that was most important. There's going to be a special issue of accounting history on accounting history in the digital digital age of digitalization. Um, co guest edited by myself and Julia Leone. And uh, the call for papers will be going out for that. And Adam, that is very much uh, focused on what you've been doing, if you like. Uh, so I'll be in touch because it would be very good for us if we could get something from you to, in that issue, if it's at all possible. But I'll be in touch. Right, Matt, on all to right. you. All right, thank you. All right, so I think um, we're actually due for a five minutes break. I don't know if we, uh, we'll just carry on, I, I guess. I just have a ride on that. Okay, so we, so we have the second, uh, well, the third presentation of the paper in progress. So we have uh, uh, Marina here. Marina, are you? Yeah. I'm here, I'm here. Okay, good, good. So um, so we'll give you the opportunity to carry on. Do you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Now? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah. Good. 
So, uh, thank you for this possibility to present our paper. It is a draft of paper. So, our paper explores uh, the life and professional activity of the first Russian lecture on accounting at the Russian State University, Stepan Usov and his views on the theory and practical implementation of new accounting techniques in agriculture. To accomplish this task, uh, we relied on the actor network theory, uh, the foundations of which were developed by scholar Bruno Lotter. Three parts of presentations are the stages of uh, life and professional activities of Stepan Usov, his views on the theory and practice of accounting, and formation of accounting as an academic discipline in Russia. Accounting historians uh, view accounting as a social practice now, and actor network theory is one of uh, psychology concept. We use it to um, because it describes the world as uh, networks of relationships. Networks can be an important source of dissemination of ideas and diffusions of, uh, diffusion of practices. This theory makes use of some of the simplest properties of nets and then add uh, to it an actor that does some work. The addition of actor deeply modifies the network. In our paper, we use the classification of actors created by Lotto. He divided all actors on intermediaries and mediators. Intermediaries are entities which transport the force of some other entity more or less without transformation, and so are very uninteresting for us. Mediators are entities which multiply difference and so should be the object of study. Their outputs cannot be predicted by their inputs. Their activity is described as mediation or translation. We analyzed the role of Stepan Usov as a mediator in the development of network aimed at disseminating knowledge about agricultural economics and rural bookkeeping in Russia. In Russia, which was an agrarian country at the beginning of the 18th century, the creation of such a network was a necessary condition for overcoming the agricultural crisis, activating the agricultural market and the formation of a new class of land owners, which was to come to replace the nobles with their irrational and extensive ways of management. Stepan Usov, uh, who was he? He was the son of a serf who received his freedom and uh, who entered St. Petersburg University and graduated from the physics and mathematics faculty. Then Usov conducted his father's business for several years and at the same time was actively engaged in self-education, attended university lectures on natural disciplines and read a lot, read a lot. Then uh, Stepan Usov got married and he raised 11 children. Some of them uh, became famous persons. His son Pavel was an editor, Michael uh, a lawyer, uh, Peter was an engineer and Vladimir was a military man. Stepan Mikhailovich Usov, like uh, uh, some professors at that time, was actively involved in publishing and editorial activities. He headed an agriculture gazette, published his own newspaper intermediary, uh, led the works of the Imperial Free Economic Society and newspaper Economic Notes. In the 1830s, uh, Usov became an author of the very popular newspaper, Northern Bee. Uh, his articles were very informative, written with a desire to bring real benef benefits to readers. To revive the material, he often resorted to curious reports, travel notes, letters to publishers. Usov spoke several la languages, French, German, English, understood Polish, Swedish, Italian, Spanish. His first fundamental economic works, work was his translation from German, a book written by Krasik, a subsidiary book for landlords and farmers. The need for, calculation, for, for publication was explained by the lack of books on agriculture in Russia at that time. 
major works in the field of agriculture were his books. Uh, we can, you can see the titles of his of these books on the slide. At the end of the 1850s, Stepan Usov began editing publications of the Imperial Free Economic Society, of which he had been an active member. Stepan Usov uh, took over as a lecturer in the Department of Agriculture, Forestry, and Commercial Accounting at St. Petersburg University. Uh, then later, he became a professor of this university and uh, in 1959, Dean of the Law Faculty. You can see announcement in the newspaper about public lecture in 1836 um, in Russian. This is a fragment in Russian of this announcement. Um, uh, he was an official at the same time. Uh, since 1838, Stepanusov becomes an official of the Agriculture Department of the Ministry of State Property, as well as a corresponding member of its scientific committee. Thus, uh, Usov, as talented researcher and active citizen, used all possible available ways to realize the goal of his life, to spread knowledge about rational agriculture, publishing magazines and newspapers, reviewing and translating the works of foreign authors, writing articles and books, reading lectures and speaking at public meeting, meetings, uh, preparation of government projects in the field of agriculture policy. Let's discuss uh, his innovations in the state and farm accounting. In studies on the accounting history, there has never been any mention of the views of Usopp on the subject of bookkeeping. Since he's published monographic works, previously known, are in no way related to accounting. He would like to present to the, we would like to present to, to academic community a small work, Rules of Rural Accounting, published by Usov in the appendix to the second edition of the book of German agronomist Krasik. This work is kept in Moscow Central Library and we analyzed two copies of this book. One of them is not full, but a uh, second copy contains 20, 21 pages. And in this book, Stepan Musov defined the goals and objectives of accounting in, in agriculture, described the necessary accounting registers, and gave examples of filling out accounting books. There was uh, practically no specialized literature on agricultural bookkeeping in the first half of the 18th century in Russia. Traditional form of regulation was an instruction in which the landover regulated the activities of his clerks, determined the structure of the farm administration and procedures for collecting duties from peasants. Only two works on agriculture written by Memersky and Karpovich were published in the beginning of the 18th century. These books mainly contained the rules of agronomy, not of bookkeeping. And uh, we uh, analyze a book of uh, Usov, and then we propose to consider this work in conjunction with his master thesis on capital in relation to agriculture. In his master thesis, Usov insisted on dividing the capital into natural, productive, and reserve. In accordance with this classification, Usov uh, proposed to keep accounts in the capital book, land account, buildings account, account of peasant families, etc. Usov's main idea was to view the state as an enterprise. He investigated the components of capital and recommended the correct ratio of its parts as a prerequisite for the success of the economy. The result of such rational activity should have been profit that is uh, the excess of farm income over expenses. Usov promoted uh, the dissemination of progressive business methods, in modern terms, capital investment. The traditional accounting registers in the practice of, of land, law, land overs uh, were income and expense books at that time. Usov offered the following mandatory list of required books capital book, memorable diary, principal ledger, and cash book. 
According to USAP, the goal of accounting is to provide information to the owner to give the farm on a better path. Information about the financial position, financial result, and comparison of individual parts of the farm. Comparing a list of accounts is the most uh, important task of a good accountant, uh, as, as uh, Usaf wrote. For this, he must deeply understand the processes and activities of the economy. Uh, he notes the need to build an accounting system not according to a regulated forms, but according to the actual need of a particular economy, depending on the types of activities its size, location, and management structure. Usov proposed to distinguish main and additional accounting systems for the whole estate, for example, and for the particular farm. At the end of the book, Usov gave examples of filling out books. And uh, by the way, we know that the registration of serfs is recommended in the same way as for things or cash, opening balance plus inflow minus outflow, it is closing balance. They calculate the number of peasants and serfs. serfs. However, he did not disclose in detail the issues of evaluating individual items of capital, did not describe algorithm for closing accounts, compiling a balance sheet, or calculating profits. Therefore, it is difficult to judge the practical applicability of his system. Also did not call his system of bookkeeping as a double entry, did not compare it with the traditional single entry. Analyzing the example given by Usov, we can state that his system is an intermediate stage between single entry and double entry bookkeeping. Innovative in this system was the construction of a system of accounts specific to agriculture, as well as emphasizes on not monitoring the safety of the property, but on identifying the financial result of activity. The role of USAF innovations in accounting would not be so significant if it was not for his active position. He became known as a first lecture on accounting, the course of which uh, he presented at State uh, at St. Petersburg University in 1836. There are some, there were some educational institutions in Russia where bookkeeping was studied at that time. In all these educational institutions, accounting was taught as a sum of practical skills. Theoretical concepts were not mentioned. Specific of the lectures uh, of Usov was the combination in one course of both knowledge of agriculture and bookkeeping. And this information was presented to the audience, not in the form of a set of recommendations for filling out accounting books, but was linked to the laws of philosophy and political economy. In his lectures, Stepan Usov advocated not only for mastering advanced accounting techniques, and their implementation and practice. He argued that accounting is a science necessary for the formation of the elite of Russian society, the mastery of which will benefit all citizens and foster a sense of responsibility for the economic prosperity of the state. In the beginning, accounting was not uh, regarded as a university subject. Uh, Usov only gave public lectures, which were attended annually 400 or 500 people. These lecture, uh, lectures became very popular in St. Petersburg. Later, accounting was included uh, into some legal education uh, courses. Uh, at the end of the 18th century, teaching accounting spread to other institutions of higher education in Russia and accounting achieved the status of university subject. We argue that activity of Stepan Usov as mediator <laughs> helped to make this achievement. So at the end of the 19th century, teaching accounting spread uh, to other institutions and accounting uh, achieved the status of university subject. It was a result of uh, activity of Stepan Usov as well. 
Thank you for your attention. That's all. Wow. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marina. That's very good. Uh, precisely on time. That's that, that's very good. So I'll hand you over to Karen. Karen is the uh, discuss, uh, discussant for the paper. Uh, Karen, over to you, please. Thank you very much, um, Marina, for a really clear and enlightening presentation telling us all about Stefan Usoff. Um, this is the first draft um, of what promises to be a wide ranging paper looking at the achievements of Stefan Usoff. So this prominent Russian who advocated the intensification of agriculture, rationalization of management in landlord estates and introduced progressive agricultural technologies and new methods of land cultivation. But more importantly for us as accounting historians, also published the rules of rural accounting in the early to mid 1800s. Um, I think this is really an in, really interesting paper in the terms of what was happening internationally at that stage as well. I've been doing myself have been doing some um, work recently on hospital accounting um, in a similar period in the UK. And again, there was the introduction of uniform accounting. And I'm working with um, Eleonora, who has been looking at Italian accounting. And again, there's been this introduction of um, uniform accounting. So there, there seems to be an international aspect to this as well. Um, I think I'd like to say a couple of things that are very similar to what Alan said earlier to Darren, um, and I would like to relate back to his comments of perhaps being a little bit more critical and, and involving a little bit more critical thinking into your paper in order to develop it. Um, I'd also like to make a similar comment on relating sources, so you, you have a really, really interesting story, but you d often don't put into the paper the sources where you found the information. So the paper tells the story of um, this professor, Yusinov, and as the first professor of accounting. Um, but as I said, this is a first draft of a paper. So the paper currently lacks a really clear introduction. It also currently lacks a literature review, but this is sort of understandable for a first draft. At the moment, it is just the story. Um, for the sake of completeness as a discussant, I would like to make some observations, but I do appreciate that this is that first draft and could not be expected to be that developed. So. I think what I'd like to say applies much more generally to papers that have quite a discursive theme to them. I think you need to think a little bit more about your contribution and to frame your contribution, contribution and to enforce that before submitting it for publication. So although the, the paper tells an interesting story, there needs to be more thought as to the focus of that story and some improvements in the motivation and development of the story underpinning the paper. As I said, there's no wide literature review showing where it fits with prior research, which leaves some uncertainty about its contribution relative to the other research, but I think you will be able to sort that out. Um, one way of doing this, and again, this is where perhaps th this, these comments apply more widely to discursive papers, is that a much clearer introduction would inform the reader of the objectives of the paper and its contribution in relation to other research. So that needs to be quite succinct and clearly state the aims and objectives of the paper. The current paper is a good start but it needs to be enforced to, to highlight the novel contributions. Specifically, the introduction should provide answers to the following questions. And what I'm gonna do after this is actually put these um, questions into the chat, because as I said, I think these are more generally um, helpful. So I would suggest in an introduction, you might have some answers to the following questions, perhaps one paragraph or a couple of sentences um, to clarify the structure of the paper. You need to talk about what the general phenomenon you are studying is and why it's important. Who cares? 
what has been done so far in terms of research on the subject? So who said what? What is the problem with this research? What's the gap in our understanding that you want to, to meet? And why is it important to close this gap? What is the contribution? And what is the solution that you're proposing to resolve the problem? How are you going to close the gap? What is, the, what is your paper giving us? Um, you currently speak to some of these points, which is a really good start. But in the paper, your arguments need to be a little bit clearer and better explained. So the above structure or that structure may actually be helpful for that. But for now, uh, and would help you in clearly highlighting and analyzing your findings as well. Mm -hmm. So you would have like a golden thread running through your paper that gives you um, the clear view of where you're going with the story. But for now, I appreciate that it's a first draft and I'd like to thank you for introducing us to such an interesting and diverse accounting professor and one whose achievements we may all obviously hope to emulate. Thank you very much, Marina and Dimitri. Yeah. Thank you right. very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Carrie, for that. Um, perhaps it could be um, it could be helpful if you um, could send uh, any notes you have, so we'll, we'll send it to Marina. It certainly will. Yes. All right. So, so Marina, uh, she will send you notes uh, with those uh, summary. All right. Thanks. Uh, do you have any other comments on this? Any comments or suggestions? Um, I don't know if I can uh, just uh, have a couple of comments and the question. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I noticed uh, from the presentation that uh, actually there seem to be um, a couple of papers uh, into the work that has been done uh, around uh, uh, Stefan Usov. One uh, is related to the figure in itself of Stefan as a scholar in accounting, and we have got different examples of um, how to delineate the, the figures, uh, life and challenges, and also achievement of uh, accounting uh, scholars. But the other one uh, on which um, uh, that got my attention was uh, mainly the part related to this agricultural accounting, mm -hmm. not only because uh, there is a special issue of accounting history that is about uh, the exploitation of the natural world that is um, uh, co-guest edited by Christopher Napier, but also because uh, when uh, you were uh, uh, analyzing uh, the, the, the records, um, and uh, how uh, Stefan would have uh, presented uh, this uh, agricultural accounting and the method and the different uh, books that were uh, supporting agricultural accounting. I was actually thinking how from uh, the, the analysis that, that you have done on this, uh, the risk that is uh, intrinsically um, hold within agriculture is actually represented throughout this, uh, this accounting. Because agriculture differently from other type of activities like service or industry and so on uh, is uh, um, a, a, an economic activity in which the, the climate risk or the risk not to have enough uh, enough harvest for the following season is very important and that was captured for instance even in the Benedictine convents in the medieval period uh, through their own accounting and through the accounting of the physical quantities, for instance, that were only afterwards translated in money or in other type of uh, uh, currencies. So I was wondering if there is any aspect regarding this uh, risk in, in agriculture that uh, you were able to identify through, uh, through your analysis of um, uh, the work of Stefan Uzov. Unfortunately, we have only 21 pages. Yeah. Only 21 pages of this small work. We have no text of lectures or some another materials. Uh, so we have no information about all uh, what all range of uh, issues in agriculture and bookkeeping. Uh, and we can analyze only this small work, only text of this small work. 
there are no there are no any words about risks not um, but uh, he wrote about um, possible profit and possible loss of course possible loss and uh, uh, his uh, his desire was his um, his proposal was to antif um, to use the way as intensification of uh, not extensive ways of uh, development of uh, economy for example to uh, have new lands to have new new um, his 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 solution was to use modern techniques modern technologies yes to to avoid some risks some losses yes his recommendation was uh, to intensi intensificate this uh, estate uh, to use uh, different rational decisions to compare to compare different parts of uh, a state and choose more profitable in this case in this time sometimes in uh, some regions were speci specialized on uh, various products and this is a way to choose correct way right right product correct product to uh, to produce so it was a, a sort of a strategic type of uh, accounting for strategic choices regarding the type of harvest. Management accounting, not strategic maybe, but tactical, tactical. Yeah, yes, because uh, his attention to this um, agricultural accounting might, might also link back uh, to a sort of background about uh, what was uh, at that point in time the status quo of um, of the accounting for uh, farmers so his interest in 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 that might be uh, might be like backed up by some background of what was happening at that time yeah i i, I think that would be a, a very interesting area to explore what uh, uh this uh, laura is uh, raising about his interest in agricultural accounting uh, sort of. but but our time is um Actually, uh, running up now. Uh, I must thank everyone for coming to the workshop and thanks again, Marina, for your presentation. Uh, just a few more details that, that I want to um, let you know. We, we hope to run this workshop again in February and in March. So you might want to take note of these uh, uh, important dates for, uh, for your diary. So, so we have a planned workshop for for March, sorry, for February, and that will be on Tuesday, February 9th. So that's that will be a Tuesday, uh, 9th of February. Uh, I want to share my screen for that. And the same for uh, March. So it's Tuesday, Tuesday, 9th, 9th for both February and March. So uh, we uh, will we'll be sending some details of, regarding the February uh, workshop. So we will look forward to your participation as well. So there'll be some emails uh, later on on that. Yeah, again, uh, thanks very much for supporting the group. I don't know, Ali, do we have uh, any more uh, questions? Only one thing, the, we've had uh, two more papers sent to us. So we're going to look at whether or not we should have a workshop in April as well. Uh, but we're definitely having the ones in February and March. All right, all right, thanks. So, so, we'll, be so the, we'll be sending out the program and all the details in the next few days for the February workshop. All right, that's fine. Yeah, so if you submitted your paper, I'm sure you will, you'll get some email on that. All right, thank you everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed the session. We look forward to the February uh, workshop again. Uh, it's very good to see a lot of people across uh, different countries signing up for this. And we just say thank you very much to all the participants and thank you especially to our presenters and our keynote speaker today. Can we thank in the usual way? Mm. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks. <laughs> all right, that's it from me. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a nice day.